blood flow into the lungs. Now I'm not sure what time this started. Do you know it's under? No idea. Excitement took over. Um, but oh, I missed that. How long did I say? It's been 40 minutes since they started jump started jumping on this buffalo. Now it's probably been a bit shorter because of the drought, but I have seen it take nearly two hours to kill a big buffalo bull. And that was with a bigger pride of lions in the Inkumas. But that buffalo was in prime condition. So these buffalo bulls, uh, I could only see bulls, I didn't see any other buffalo as they charged past us. And uh, these bulls are old, past prime, and this drought would have definitely had an effect on them. And it does make them an easier, easier target. But by no means an easy target. Yeah, the breathing getting much shallower. And you can hear that. And you can see she's, she's putting extra force on, she's biting harder now. I don't think it's long now. See those uh, breathing getting much, much shallower. The, the, almost the leg kicks now almost non existent. She's only going to let go when that buffalo finally expires. Their leg kicks very, very weak now. I don't think it's long to go now before this into the end of this poor big boy. You can see she almost senses it's close to the end. Now, as I said, it's an old buffalo bull. Wingnut's wondering how old. I guess probably between 12 and 14 years old. And so past his prime. And about 10, 11, they're pushed out of the, the big breeding herds. And they live in these bachelor groups. And these Inkahumas have been specializing in these bachelor groups of buffalo this dry season.
Now that is actually stomach content on her shoulder there that sprayed out of the intestines as they pulled them out. There we go, you can see that on her neck there. It's not blood, it's buffalo stomach content that sprayed out as the other lioness pulled out their intestines. There's a very good chance there'll be a male lion here by tomorrow. If there are any in the vicinity, they definitely would have heard that buffalo's distress calls. Now Meg's wondering, can another lioness take over the nose grip? It is possible, Meg, but unlikely in this situation where the buffalo is down. You can hear now the breathing is getting very, very difficult. Starting to become sometimes some big gaps between the, the breaths. Hi, William in Oregon. William would like to know. Why do they always seem to start eating it from the rear end? Well, with buffalo, it's the safe end because they, they'll start feeding or actually opening up that area to try and weaken it during the hunt. And secondly, it's the nice, the rump, the nice tender, lots of meat there. So you'll find a lot of animals, um, especially cats, will, will start eating at the rear end, at the rump, because it in case they lose it to another lion or hyenas or whatnot, they get the most amount of meat in the shortest part of time without having to chew through any bones. Now, is that other lion that's going in to help or is she just going to start feeding? Looks like the other lioness has come to expedite these proceedings. There you can see there's that stomach content oh, sorry, on that lioness's neck. Again, apologies to our sensitive viewers. It's nearly over.
even if she had to let go of that nose hold now, there's no way this poor boy would survive. She has not relinquished that grip on his nose since she got there. And she won't till he takes his last breath. Now that crunch, crunch you hear is that lioness at the tail cutting open the skin. See how she's sliced the skin open there. You can actually see it's almost like someone's taken a pair of scissors and cut a perfectly straight line. Now her premolars, are which what she's using to cut open to get to the skin to get to the meat, are literally like a really sharp pair of side cutters. Now again, apologies to our sensitive viewers. This is live. This is raw. This is uncut. This is happening right now in the African bush. And if you are a little bit sensitive, just look away. It'll be over in about 10 or so minutes. The buffalo should be dead. And I know it is disturbing, but one must remember, this is the future for these lions. They've got eight little cubs to feed. So a big buffalo bull like this is a great catch for the evening. He stopped breathing. No, he's still, he's still kicking. I can't be far now. Just trying to watch carefully to see when he starts stops breathing. Now sometimes you will have leg kicking after the animal is dead. It's just their nerves. The heart will still be pumping. See those look almost more like those nerve reactions, not coordinated. Yeah, I think he's expired. Have a look at his stomach, see if it still looks like it's breathing. Okay, just move a little bit higher up onto the, there we go, onto that part of the stomach. I just want to have a look. He's, 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 he's almost stopped breathing, but he's still alive. He's gasping. There we go, she's let him go. It's done. Here we go. Now she's going to lie down and have a well-earned rest before she even thinks about starting to feed. And 
here we go. The one, two lioness is resting. The a third eating. I wonder where the fifth in Kahuma is. Well, the fourth one, I think, might have gone back to fetch the cubs. Now, all that sniffing around earlier might have been after these buffalo. I wish. Wouldn't it be nice if we could speak lion? What I find incredible with lions is the non-verbal communication. So how they read each other's body language. Oh, there comes the small intestine. So it's incredible that they're able to, to, to sort of maneuver and flank, all depending on the movement and body language of the other animals. And I think that's probably one of the most fascinating things for me about lions is is that non-verbal that non-vocal so not verbal they can't speak but that non-vocal communication so of course lions have their vocal communications their roars their contact calls but in the hunt they can't because it'll give away their position So once they get that buffalo open, uh, generally they'll try to get for the, the sort of high value items, heart, kidney, lung, livers, high in vitamins and minerals, particularly the liver, high iron content. But as you can see, they're not fussy. Those are the intestines and that is stomach content coming out as she pulls through. She obviously doesn't eat that sort of half digested grass what she's really after there is that the actual lining of the intestine now she doesn't want to eat but now just because there's another line there they all growl at you I think she's gonna lie down for a bit more well, she might head back there's one of the mothers she might head off to go fetch cubs or she might head off down towards Buffalo's Hook for a drink There you go, she's walking straight towards Jamie. Now oh, she's changing her direction. And she might, maybe she's heading back towards the cups, who knows? So I know you guys can still see that lioness with Jamie. I can't see her at all now. So there we go. We're with the two remaining lionesses. I wonder if she's going to go fetch those cubs. I think she's going to go for a drink at Buffalo's Hook first. Now the fact that there's almost zero fighting around this carcass means that these lions have been incredibly well fed over the last while and that is, the drought has definitely been aiding them.
So normally in a situation like this, if these lions had been desperately hungry, there would be much growling, snarling and beating of each other uh, at, as they took down the buffalo and started feeding. Well, it seems like everyone's off. I'm sure one lioness will stay. The next one's off down the road. I can't see it. That is another one of the mothers that's moved away. There she goes. So four lionesses. Maybe it's only amber eyes left behind. And the three mothers have gone off to fetch the cubs. Let's have a look at the Yeah, that doesn't look like a lactating lioness. So that means the missing lioness is the youngest female. Maybe she's off entertaining a Birmingham boy. So, the last time, or not the last time, the time before last year, when we saw the Incahumas uh, grab a buffalo, it was Amber Eyes who was on the nose. This time it wasn't. So there we go, that also answers that question. It's not always the same line in the same spot. Isn't this amazing? We're sitting here in the middle of the African bush live. And remember, if you have any questions about what just happened, about what's going on, remember to send them through to us at questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. It's incredible, it's just sort of the excitement's down, the buffalo's down. Sort of take a moment. I tend to get very excited over a butterfly. So imagine how excited I get when we get to see incredible behavior like that. And of course, <clears throat> a lot of people get worried and think we, we're all after the death and the, and the blood and the guts and the gore. It's not that. And so we get to see this incredible animal behavior that so few people in the world ever get to witness. And just guess what? We just witnessed it live. Now D is wondering if a male lion came along, would this female leave? Well, not necessarily leave D, but um, she would probably have to leave her spot at the kill for him. And he might chase off and they can be quite selfish, only liking to feed by, them, by themselves. I say it'll be incredibly un unlikely that there won't be a male lion tomorrow. I think it's very likely there will be a male. Now, those big boys, they hear that buffalo go boo and they come a jogging. So it took probably just under 50 or just under an hour for this buffalo to die, which is about normal 40 minutes to an hour. I'm sure a few of you are wondering where the hyenas are. Now at the moment, our hyena clan has moved a bit further to the northwest. So we're not seeing them too much, but for hyenas to steal this kill from lions, you can work on an average of three hyenas to one lion. So there would have to be, if all five lionesses were present, there'd have to be 15 hyenas for them to sort of mob the, the, 
the Inkahuma pride off this carcass. Now, if you add a male into the equation, the hyenas will stay away. It's very, very seldom and that the hyena is brave enough to take on a male lion. He's just that much stronger and that much more powerful than the females. What a first drive back. Kitty cat luck seems to be with me still. Now from the incredible Inkahumas across to James with the Kichwet Tembo pride I think. Let's see what they're up to. Well, that, everybody, is just astounding while we sit here with the sleeping lions. Well, one clean itself. Who would have thought it? Well, I suppose everybody who loves the Ninkapumas. They have pulled it out of the bag and killed a buffalo here in exactly as we wanted them to. Lion kills at night. How fantastic they have been. This bunch has been doing not a great deal. Um, since I last saw you, obviously we were stuck, and that is not an uncommon occurrence for me. And what happened was, oh, sorry, we've got, <laughs> we're going straight back to South Africa, there's even more action going on. They've got cubs running into the kill. Yoku's arrived. on their way. And in a way, whilst it doesn't make everything better, what we've just witnessed, it certainly makes us feel a little bit more comfortable about what we've just witnessed as eight hungry mouths are about to be fed. There they go. Off behind us, Dave. I think there's one on the right as well. I mean, on the left. Well, there was. You could just hear it in the dark. Okay, I think that's everyone. I'm just going to wait until they've gone a little bit further behind me and then I'm going to turn our vehicle around and we'll catch up with them. Wow, what an intense light this has been. <coughs> Hoping there's nobody here. Hello. I'm going to go move very, very slowly and I'm just going to check behind me. And then Dave's going to provide me with that infrared light and it will take us to the cubs. Alright Dave, I'm in your hands now. <laughs> I'm driving blind. There they go, over the ridge. I'm just going to make very, very sure that there's not one on the other side of us. I can see them up ahead. I'm not going very fast and I'm not racing to catch up with them because I don't want to risk. I can only see a couple of meters in front of me. So we're going really, really slowly. As the cubs make their way to a meal that the females worked incredibly, incredibly hard to get for them. Whoopsie, I think the road's a little bit to the left there. That's so amazing, the silhouettes of the lions in front of me. I don't know if we're going to be able to capture it. But there they all go. Little cubs. Isn't that incredible? With their amazing mothers. calling, frolicking, playing, chasing each other around. In the high spirits, the females just exhausted after that trial that they were put through. 
and the cubs bounding in anticipation of some very, very full bellies pouncing on each other. And although it's very, very hard to watch an animal die like that, remembering that there are hungry little mouths to feed is definitely a comfort. Look at you, you little scamps. Hmm? Are you too gorgeous for words? <laughs> the poor lionesses, they're so exhausted, and all the little ones want to do is play with them. It just goes to show that lioness that left earlier on in the hunt went straight to fetch the cubs as soon as she knew that that buffalo was going down. And those two lionesses went off to fetch them. <laughs> just little silhouettes in green. Amazing. Well done, Nkuhumas. Sorry, Mr. Buffalo. All right, let's jump on board with Brent as they make their way over in his direction. Here we go, the first of the cubs have arrived at the buffalo kill. Here they come. Now, let's see, the first one, who's going to be the first one to rush towards the the carcass get ready for some of the fiercest little sounds you've heard in a while one two three four five six seven eight oh eight Now, as they get bigger, Auntie Amber is not going to be as tolerant as she once was. <laughs> Just checking it's not alive, Ma. Making sure you did your job. scuttling about. Happy cubbies. Now they seem so well fed they're more interested in playing than eating. Perfect, thanks yours. So here we go, as you can see, we are sitting absolutely in the pitch black. I cannot see a thing, and I'm looking at my monitor. What has that cub got at the back there? Is that my hat? No, I'm joking, it's not my hat. It's the tail. Yes, I, I could have lost my hat, but he's stolen the tail. He's <laughs> having a great game with it. Isn't this incredible? This infrared enables us to view cubs at night. Normally, no spotlights on cubs until they're about between six and eight months old. But with infrared, we remove. Look at him. <laughs> Looks very impressed with himself. Cheers, yours. Have a good evening. It was awesome to enjoy you, eh? Yeah, thanks. It was awesome to have you here as well. Second time. <laughs> so just saying goodbye to yours. That's the second time yours and I have seen the Inkahumas together take down the buffalo. And he's got off the ear. Ooh, there's him, yeah. That's a bit of growling starting. Now, 
Now Michael's wondering, are male cubs slightly more aggressive than females, especially around food? Well, generally, they can be, just because they're a bit bigger. And in lion society, quite often size goes a very long way. Now wait, there's going to be, let's see how long it takes them before they get upset with each other and they can't share. As I said, they're so full, they're not really that worried about eating. Ears flat. No serious growling at each other just yet. Females moving back in. Hi, Jerry. Uh, Jerry's wondering how long it'll take for them to eat that entire carcass. Big bull like this, Jerry, and they're not too hungry, probably two to three days. Now it all depends if a male arrives, then of course the carcass won't last nearly as long. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah, I was expecting a lot more growling, snarling between the little guys. And obviously so fat on mom's milk. And all the buffalo, oh, buffalo that they've been caught over the last little while. And it's more fun in games than feeding. <laughs> Who's the king of the buffalo? Yeah, more playing than actually eating going on here. It's practicing the throat grip on the, the buffalo's armpit. bit of growling just but not much. We can hear frogs and a fiery necked night jar in the background. And of course we have an incredibly ecstatic in Kahuma Pride. If you've just happened to stumble upon us, this is live infrared viewing of Lion Pride on a kill. And can you believe we watched them take down this buffalo live? You are watching with me at the exact same time. Isn't that incredible? We are able to bring you the immense and amazing animals from Africa live wherever you are, might be in the world. Remember, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to send us any questions.
Now, Doug in Connecticut's wondering, will the Cubs be able to break through that tough buffalo hide with their still young milk teeth? Probably not. Maybe in some of the softer spots on, on the belly, uh, but generally they will go like those ones there to where the lionesses have already opened up the carcass. head in there. I can just sneak and sneak ahead in there. I said they're not particularly hungry otherwise there'd be a lot more snarling, growling and swatting. Oh, that little one, he's practicing catching buffalo up front. Not interested in eating. Oh no, he's, he's caught and killed. He's happy. Yes, you big brave thing you. So we're going to sit here with the Kahumas, but let's go see what's happening in the Mara Triangle with James. Hello everybody. Sorry about the very quick link last time, but I'm not actually sorry at all. You've got to go and watch the little Linkahuma cubs arriving at their kill. And well deserved it is for them indeed. Our cats, as you can see from the thermal imaging camera, are, well, very tired. But just behind them, a herd of what Graham Wallington calls bogies. The bogies have the wind from blowing sort of from the lions to them, we think. We can't really tell. It seems to be swirling slightly. But that is the potential hunt that might happen here if these lions can bring themselves to just wake up and do something other than nothing. There we are. Two sleeping on the left. One under a termite mind on the right, the other one lurking about here somewhere. Now we think this is four lionesses, we're going to vaguely conclude that they might be from something called the Out of Africa Pride. It's been very difficult to figure out what's going on, because every time we thought we'd figured out what was happening, two more lionesses would, dis would appear. I'm assuming that we're not very far from where that zebra died, so I'm assuming two of these are perhaps the two that were at the zebra earlier, then two more appeared as we got stuck, and then, of course, I didn't want to get my boots dirty, so we sent Graham and um, Tyler and John Dre and William out to push the car out, and they did that very successfully. We then followed these lions, and they went to sleep, which is what they have done quite frequently here. I'm beginning to think that, A, they do quite a lot of killing during the daytime, and B, well, I mean, they hardly look like they're desperately hungry. So they do quite a lot of feeding during this time of the year and quite a lot of hunting during the day. But the Kichwatembo Pride, who knows what they're doing tonight? Who knows what the males are doing? We took a gamble on this bunch and, um, <laughs> well, it hasn't quite paid off like the Inkahumas have. But, you know, if you've got vehicles traversing the entire continent of Africa, as we have at the moment, you're going to find at least one pride of lions intent on finding themselves some supper. If that pride of lions happens to have eight little cubs to feed, well, then they're probably even more likely to go hunting than they would be in this rather prey-rich environment. Let's have one last look at the fl... No, sorry. Graham, can we have one last look at the fleur? Thank you very much. Let's see where the... Um, See where the other are. There, we're back on that herd of potential bogies <laughs> who are just twinkling very pleasantly off towards the east. <laughs> Hello, Lisa. A very good question from you. Um, you want to know how much time or how often I think these various prides in the Mara cross paths. Lisa, you know. Uh, 
I mean, I, I, I have simply haven't been here long enough to say, but I do think from what we've learnt over the brief time we've been here, that there is so much, um, so much upheaval when the migration comes through, so much kind of you know, unusual behaviour when the migration comes through that I would imagine it's quite difficult to pre to predict because certainly the Kitra Tembo Pride. Um, I thought we, we've seen them as far. Have we seen them this far? Yes, we have. We've said, well, we haven't. We haven't seen them quite far, this, quite this far south. But um, I think they have been seen certainly this far south. And it would make their territories pretty small if they never came across each other. So I think it's rather fascinating. I don't want to put my um, head on a block, as it were, and try and guess what's going on here. But yes, they, they certainly could. Um, they certainly, they certainly could come across each other. But they do call a lot. You know, if you sit on top where we're staying at Ngamari, you sit on the deck in the evenings, there's calling from all over this place. So maybe they, their territories shrink during this time of the year. It could happen with very sort of prey-rich areas. That could definitely be the case. And then maybe they get a little bit bigger and spread out from each other uh, when the wildebeest and zebra and Irland and Thompson's go, go wandering down south into the Serengeti. But I've got to tell you, it'd be wonderful to spend a year here and figure out exactly what is going on. And of course, the only way you can do that is to spend an extended period with these animals. That one is alive. You can see there it's breathing. Aqua, a nice question from you about whether or not these prides have smaller or larger territories than the ones in the Sabi Sand. From what I've seen here, I'm going to say they're slightly smaller. That would make perfect sense given the prey density here. The prey density here is, I would say, probably quite a lot higher than it is in the Sabi Sand. At the moment, of course, we're in the middle of a drought in the Sabi Sand, or it's just kind of broken, and so things are a weak and b coming out of the Kruger into the Sabi sand because there's pumped artificial water and so there you know it's probably relative no, it's still not equitable even at this stage so i'm going to say i think it would make sense that the prides here would have smaller territories um the Nkuhuma prides territory is probably about 5000 hectares which is just over 10000 acres and I would have said the prides here from what, I mean, this is based on combined experience of about eight days here. I would say that the pride territories here are probably, and I'm, this is a wild guess, but about four, maybe three or four thousand hectares each. So between, say, nine thousand and eleven thousand acres. Now, whether that situation persists when the migration moves away, I don't know. You see, I mean, in the Sabi sand, the uh, you know the prey situation is relatively stable throughout the year. Same number of impala and nyala and kudu and buffalo and giraffe and other wonderful creatures that we get there. And then over here, of course, the situation does change. But the game is still thick on the ground during the rest of the year when the migration isn't here. There's topi. Um, there are, I think, probably some resident eland, probably some resident wildebeest and zebra. Um, plenty of um, buffalo still around, lots of giraffe, masses of warthog, there are impala here, and so I think still there's a lot to eat here. But maybe with the reduction in prey numbers, um, the lions spread out a bit. It would be fascinating to find out, I must say. And I've, I mean, I've tried to read up on all of this stuff before we got here, and there's precious little... And I don't think that's necessarily indolence on the part of the researchers. I think it's just simply that it's actually quite difficult to figure out what on earth is going on here. And I think only an extended period with the same lions could truly figure out what was happening. Then, of course, I mean, while I'm waffling on like this, um, there is the, the small matter of a pride takeover here. New males coming into the area, a couple of nomads coming up with the migration. Apparently, Scarface brought two females into, or created almost the Kitchell Timber Pride by bringing some females across with him from the Marsh Pride. So, you know, I think things are also in a state of flux here at the moment. And maybe in a couple of months' time, they'd have settled down a bit like these lions which have settled down profoundly
<laughs> uh, right, we've had some amazing action today, but the link I've just been asked for in the context of what we've had today has just blown my mind. We're going to go across to Jamie, who's got a spider on her dashboard. The joys of live wildlife filming, particularly in summer, means that we acquire a whole host of passengers, including this spider that just emerged on my dashboard out of nowhere and went scuttling across and has now settled in the corner. I don't know what it is. My first instinct was that it was a wolf spider. It's definitely an active hunter. You can see that in the structure of its body and its legs and the speed with which it runs. I'm going to say one of the wolf spiders. Isn't it absolutely incredible? We can even see the hairs on its legs in this light, something that perhaps we might miss during a daytime sighting. What do you think, Mr. Spider? Or Mrs. Spider, sorry. I don't mean to be, be gender non-specific at the moment. I think you've come to the right place if you're looking for food, because we have a whole host of insects bobbing about our vehicle, attracted to the light, dashing about the dashboard, I think that the spider might just have a really, well, it's a good place to be. I think we might have collected it on our way with our antenna whilst we were driving off-road. I think we might have gathered it up in its web, or perhaps on a strand of its web, and it might have gone, come along for the ride, whether it wanted to or not. And of course, I have absolutely no idea where it came from, so I don't know how to pot it, put it back or where to put it back. But I'm quite content to have it around. That's an important lesson for us all. Please don't kill spiders. Even the ones that are meant to be venomous, well, they are venomous, they are incredibly valuable and a very, very valuable part of our ecosystem. And those of you with mosquitoes or other little insects that you don't enjoy, your spiders in your house will help to collect them and gather them up and eat them and therefore help you to control the population. And we don't kill spiders. One thing I was always taught growing up, we don't kill spiders. If we have to, we catch them in a glass and we throw them outside. This little spider can stay as long as it wants. I really don't mind. Not one of the venomous kinds. There's only really the recluse spiders or the brown widows or black widows, crab spiders. I've forgotten what I'm talking about. Oh, sack spiders, violin spiders. Those are the majorly venomous spiders that we get out here. This is not one of those. It's just a harmless... Oh! Spider! <laughs> One insect had a very lucky escape there. Flew right into our spider. Awesome. Just to give you a sense of scale, I think if I put my hand next to it, I can't seem to do it without... Mm, I think it's going to run away. That's, that's how big the spider is just to give you a sense of scale, and that's about as far as my arm will reach. <laughs> that's, that's me done, or I'm going to fall into the vehicle itself, trying to spotlight and reach for the spider. That will give you a sense of just how large this particular spider is. Quite a big one. Cool. Great. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> it was quite an uncomfortable pose I'd struck there. You can even if you look really closely, you can even see its eyes, compound eyes, sitting on the top or close to its head. Not on, sorry, not close to its head, they're part of its head. That sentence didn't make any sense. And try and spot, oh, bye. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, that's a good spot for you. Deep beneath the crack between the dashboard cover and the dashboard. I don't think you'll see it either. I think it's just below where you can see. Oh, well, that's a good spot as any, I suppose. Oh, look, there's another something. There's another bug. <laughs> the car is full of interesting surprises. Perhaps we don't want to look too closely at all of the different passengers we've acquired. The moths are all fluttering into my spotlight. Well, that's not our spider. That's, it's, that's a buddy. Another little beetle. Okay, and then we've got a host of moths sitting on the buttons. Oh, oh, now they're fluttering about. Oh dear. They were all sitting very nicely collected on my light buttons. 
And we've got, have I got a fruit chafer somewhere? No, the fruit chafers are all gone. I think I got rid of most of them while they were all flying into my face during the lion sighting. And moths everywhere. I think we're going to keep moving before we attract every single bug on Juma to our stationary lit up vehicle. Might be worth going on a trundling mission. So, after the excitement of that evening, I'm keen to top it off with something like a pangolin or an artfark. What do you say, Dave? Artfark, you say. I say artfark too. I feel like that's the only way that we're going to top the events of the last two hours. No, that is what we shall do. But of course, this place has a whole host of interesting creatures for us to find at night. Perhaps we'll be treated to another white-tailed mongoose sighting that went on forever the other evening. Longest white-tailed mongoose sighting I've ever had. But I'm feeling an art fark. It is just... We set off with a good feeling this afternoon and it's proved to be well-founded. And there's always the possibility of bumping into Tingana again. I'm on my way past where we lost him. Hopefully he's decided to pop out at some point while we were with those lions. And by the way, a round of applause everybody for Dave, who managed to stay on the back of the vehicle while I went from Tingana to that lion sighting. It was very fast. Okay, this is the only road on Juma that I have yet to, d to drive at night. This is the first time I've driven the shortcut shortcut off Galago. It's a stupid name I know, but it is what it is. And now my plan is to go to Zoe's Road, which is where we were with Tingana when I said that there's a whole host of Artfark burrows in that particular area. And that's where we're going to head to. I'm determined. I cannot believe that of all the five days that we've been trundling about in the darkest of nights, we haven't yet encountered an art fark. Hello, Zebby. Hey. As you know, we don't spotlight diurnal animals, and this zebra's not particularly comfortable, so we can switch to... Oh, no, never mind. I'm sure you're all, as our zebra disappears off anyway, I'm sure you're all dying to know what's happening at that buffalo kill. Let's head across to Brent and his adorable little cubs. Well, they're still feeding. And it's quite disconcerting to sit here in the pitch black. And I, mean, I can see my monitor, but if I look away from my monitor, all I can hear is this crunching and growling. So I'm going to keep quiet for a bit and let you just listen <laughs> no, mine. Go find another spot to eat. Uh, hi, Natalie. Uh, Natalie is wondering if hyena came, would the cubs be safe uh, if the lionesses had to protect the kill? Natalie, they generally protect the cubs before the kill. So it all depends. And so there are not too many hyenas around. I don't think our clan is around firstly or possibly big enough to challenge all of these lions at the moment so there's four adult lionesses around here so the average and there's three hyenas to one adult lioness before they become brave oh. disagreement there so you'd need at least 10 hyenas to really trouble these lions at the moment <laughs> I 
but still a relatively civil dinner so far. As I said, they're so well fed at the moment. Not too much fighting. So you can see that the behavior around the kill at night is pretty much the same as it would be would what what it would be during the day. Hi, Jean in North Carolina, and Jean would like to know, was this Zander's first lion kill? Zander, was this your first lion kill? Yep. Was it your first to kill? Yep. There we go, it was indeed Zander's first lion kill, and I'm very happy to have experienced it with, with Mr. Eggsy. We are both smiling from ear to ear, although you can't see it in the dark. Well, <laughs> you can with infrared, but I can't. <laughs> yes, and see, they're so well fed, they're more, more playing than eating quite a few of them, jumping up and down on the carcass. <laughs> Chewing on the air, which is not very tasty and not much meat there. But I suppose a nice chew toy. <laughs> Look at that <coughs> spitting. Oh, we can hear some bush fault rain fogs calling now. That what what? That, that noise there. One of my favourite frog species. They look like grumpy old men. Uh, only two lionesses here. I think the other lionesses might have headed off to go have a drink of water at Buffalo's Hook. Oh, that is a, a severely flat cat. Hard work for the night's done. Hi, TJ. Now, TJ wonders, <laughs> you're going to get a smack, little one. <laughs> what is the order of feeding? Um, cubs first, then lionesses, lionesses first, males. <laughs> Doesn't want to eat, wants to play. Uh, well, TJ, it all depends on how hungry everyone is. Uh, it's, this is quite calm and sedate because no one's particularly hungry. Now... Normally adults will tolerate cubs, uh, but they will try to eat the most first because they need the most energy, specifically the mothers, because they're producing milk and they have to do the hunting. Now, if a male was here, a male would dominate the carcass. Sometimes males will tolerate cubs feeding with them, sometimes they won't. It all just depends on the individual and the mood he's in. So there's no set order. It all, it all is depending on quite a lot of variance.
but generally lionesses will tolerate cubs feeding and feeding around them and irritating them to a degree oh what's going on closer to us i can hear sounds there we go that's what i could hear a cub talking and obviously came to see the sleeping lioness i could not see it i just heard that Now that, that, that phrase, sp uh, spitting with anger, it has to come from cats. Nothing else can quite spit with anger like a cat. That wah, wah. Now, for those of you who might have stumbled upon us, we are live in the African bush. These lions have just killed this adult buffalo bull and they've brought the cubs in to feed. Not only are we live, but we're also interactive. So I'm going to ask you guys what should we do next. Should we stay with these little lions as they devour the big buffalo? Or should we test our luck? Oof. Bit more serious of an argument there. And see if we can find any other incredible nocturnal creatures to view. And let me know by using the hashtag Safari Live. Or send an email to questions at wildearth.tv. And the temperature's dipping. I'm just putting my jacket on. Hi, Marion. Marion is in the Lone Star State, Texas. And Marion is wondering, why didn't they remove the stomach contents before starting to feed? Uh, well, because they're not particularly fussy, Marion. So, I mean, earlier you would have seen they were actually eating the intestines with the stomach contents still in it. Just have a look to our right here, Zonda. The lioness is looking up. I think those other lionesses might be coming back from their drink. And looking into this area here. Now, as I say, we, we're using infrared, so... Well, I can see absolutely nothing, uh, unless I look at my little monitor in front of me. Do you see anything? I don't know. Oh, anyway. All, that, all we know is sometimes a, a lion might appear right next to us. Now, these lions have been so well fed during this drought. As you can see, they're not too perturbed about eating. And the cubs are more playing than feeding. Well, there's a couple of them getting really stuck in there. Ah, there, that's what they might have been looking at. There was something around in the bushes next to us. I think just judging from that behavior, and you can see she's not lactating, that's Auntie Amber. <coughs> Oof. There we go, a bit more serious fight going on there now.
Now, Sarah's wondering why do the lions lick the buffalo skin? Now, Sarah, if a lion had to lick you, if it had to lick sort of two or three times in the same spot, it would actually take your skin off. It's like very coarse sandpaper. So, they actually lick to, to soften the skin up a little bit before they start using their teeth to open it. So now a lion lick, if done constantly in the same place, would actually remove human skin in their very, very rough tongues. Oh, we can hear that little one right next to us again. And it's walked probably... There they are. No, they are no more than about five feet from us. Uh, the only place that's really open for the cubs to get in is at the rump, and there is another spot up on the back. But look, look at that one, he's fast asleep on top of the buffalo. <laughs> Tired kitty. You can see those other two towards the front are just playing. That little one to the right, imagining it's caught this buffalo all by itself. No, let's annoy the sleeping one. <laughs> Fine, I'll go sleep somewhere else. Well, that's a trouble, trouble causer atop now. Full of beans, or actually full of buffalo. See, that one's managed to get in through its nether regions there. That area was opened up by the lionesses earlier. is wondering do I think they're letting the cubs eat first because nursing hurts and not only because they've been eating well so eating meat will lessen them nursing uh, Laura I don't think so especially not on a carcass of this size I mean, there's enough meat to go around if they all wanted to eat um, so I don't think so I just think they're they're, they're probably quite exhausted um, after the hunt and that's not unusual and they're just really well fed at the moment It seems like when they go shopping for buffalo, they take them down at will at the moment with the drought.
Oh, one thing about sitting in the dark is you don't see when you're knocking things over. Now, Simkin's wondering, how old are these cubs? Uh, they're various ages. I think the youngest now are probably just over three months, and the oldest must be close on five months. And uh, they are, and Simkin's also wondering, when are they weaned? Um, they're pro probably completely weaned by about six months when they lose their milk teeth and start developing their adult teeth. Oh, actually, sorry, not developing, but their adult teeth push through and, and, and the milk teeth are all gone by about six months. Not to say they won't take a chance and try suckle after that, particularly if there's different ages of cubs. So some females will lactate, or they're lactating at different times. The older cubs will often try to take a chance because lions practice aloe suckling. So they don't only suckle their own offspring, but they'll suckle all members of the pride. Okay, we're going to sit here for a bit longer, see what happens. And I don't think too much more is going to happen at this buffalo carcass about from cubs playing who's the king of the buffalo. So let's jump all the way back. And it's over a thousand nine hundred, oh, over two thousand kilometers to Kenya and see what James is up to. And we now seem to be following the lions. They've got up and they're moving. I can't see them. Jondra, can you see them? Okay. Okay, more lions at 12 o'clock. They're on the move. Hoorah, hoorah. Maybe they were just being polite and running now. John Reed, just give me a, a number. Straight ahead. She's jogging. To turn these off. We'll just turn those on. It's too bright, isn't it? John, if you see anything in front of us, you'll let me know, will you? Otherwise, we're going to go into a hole. Now, you think they're going to the carcass? Well, let's see. They might be heading towards that zebra carcass, everybody. In which case, well, it's not quite a kill. Let's follow and find out. What a night we've had. Just by the way, we were sitting here, of course, in the car with these flat kitties, and we watched quite a lot of what you were watching. And how amazing was it that the Ninkapumas and now their cubs, oh gosh, we're back with the dead zebra here. <laughs> it promised so much. Done? Which lioness this is and why she started running here? So we, we went off, everyone, to try and see if we could find whether there's a buffalo or wildebeest. They turned out to be wildebeest. Then we turned round. And that's what we found. So if you have just joined us, this, wilde, this zebra uh, will died, we think, as a result of injuries uh, inflicted by a crocodile during one of the crossings over the Mara River. We watched two lionesses eating it earlier. One of them then threw up violently. Um, and then they kind of, we drove off and we found two others. And they were shortly joined, we thought, by the two that were eating this zebra. Now suddenly, they're back here. We don't know why she threw up. We don't know why nothing is eating this thing. We don't know why that whole group of four lionesses isn't eating the zebra. It's all rather strange. And apparently the Vildes, as Graham is saying, are not too far off. 
And we're at four o'clock, so you're looking at um, sort of ten o'clock. They're about 180 degrees behind us. And we'll just keep the inf the thermal imager looking the other way at the Vildes, because if she's got up and she's from the same group of lions, which, I mean, I can't see why she wouldn't be. She's come from that direction. It's possible the others will get up and spot those wildebeers as opposed to lie in the grass and do absolutely nothing. Now this kind of situation of course where an animal dies of an injury inflicted either on it by crocodiles or perhaps by lions on a failed lion hunt. We know we've seen the Inkahumas um, who've become rather expert buffalo hunters. We know we've seen them fail before on a buffalo and leave it sort of walking around uh, injured. I think that happens here quite a lot. There's obviously so many animals here that they probably hurt each other when they do these great crossings across the river. And so a, a carcass like this, lying in the mid of, middle of a clearing, sort of unattended, is not actually that unusual. What is unusual is that it has remained or that these lions found it and then left it again. And thus one of them seems to have come up. Graham, no bogeys. I'm afraid my thermal imager is down. I'm going to, I'm going to guess that one more lioness is slowly walking. So Graham reckons one lioness slowly making its way towards us. You know me, I'm not one to guess. No, no, quite. Now Graham says he's not one to guess, um, but... Uh, that's not really true. Luckily he guesses right most of the time. Now I wonder if she hasn't smelt those Vildes. That's where she looked off. The wind is in her favour, even though she's probably smelling the worst part of that zebra right now. So we shared a couple of theories, everyone, as to why the zebra, or why the zebra was left uneaten. One of them, <laughs> one of them was, of course, that it has become infected by the crocodile's foul, rotten meat, sort of in bespattered teeth. There's something else off to the left-hand side there, and maybe that made it sick. So the, are you, have you not got IR? Thermal. Thermal, sorry. Why are there no hyenas here? That's also very odd. There you can see something just off to the right hand, to the left hand side, top left. The lioness has seen it. This could be quite interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. And you can see the zebra, I would say, Graham, starting to cool there, wouldn't you? Yeah, its fever must be dying. Its fever's dying down, yes. I mean, interesting that it was, I mean, it was as white hot on that picture as the lion was when we first found it. Now it seems to be cooling down as a result of being dead. Sally, you're in Oregon and wondering whether the zebra was still glowing. Well, certainly not with the flush of life and the views of the Mara, uh, and, but it is glowing slightly with the residual temperature of its recently ended life. But um, there that bogey, oh, we've got a pixel, one pixel off to the left hand side of the flare camera and um, it's now static. Anyway, we've got some lion action finally, it's good news. Not quite the lion action we'd hoped for. But well, that's what happens here. Live wildlife television. And brilliant that we've had a live lion kill during the special week when we'd hoped to have just that. We've had two live lion kills this week. One from the Mara, one from, well, nighttime lion kills, one from the Sabi Sand. And all in all, I think it's been a rather good return. Well, 
It's a very interesting one for me. You say, uh, do I think that it's possible for the animals to tell how putrid or sort of diseased this carcass is simply from smelling it? Um, or do I think they need to probably taste it? I would have said they probably need to taste it. You know, they, they've got very sensitive noses, but they don't have anything like the number of taste buds we do, and they don't taste anything like the sort of complexity that we do, apparently. Um, so I don't think the taste really bugs them. They probably get a sense of toxicity, though. I mean, in the same way that many animals get a sense of toxicity, at least many herbivores get a sense of toxicity from the vegetation that they eat, and they'll avoid poisonous plants. I'd love to ask this lioness why she couldn't have been bothered to go and catch a little wildebeest. Mmm, that would have been delicious. Now, Brooklyn, age 10. Just in case, obviously you weren't with us a little bit earlier. Brooklyn, that thing is called a cecum. Now, a cecum is where all of the zebra's digesting happens. So it goes through most of the intestines, which are the tubes that come out of the stomach, and they go into that thing called a cecum. And in that cecum, Brooklyn, there are a whole lot of bacteria. Now, bacteria, I will ask you, is a kind of little... I suppose you could call it somewhere between an animal and a plant. It's very small. You won't be able to see it. It's the same kind of thing that, um, you know, if you, get a, a, if you get a sore, if you get a cut on your body and it starts to turn red all around there, it's the same kind of thing that gets into there. But there are good bacteria and there are bad bacteria. And the zebra's got much, much good bacteria inside the stomach there. And that bacteria helps the zebra to digest grass. And one of the reasons you can't eat grass, Brooklyn, and why you have to eat things other than grass, is that you don't have the same bacteria as the zebra has in its cecum. And so that's why it's all, that's, that's what that big thing is there. And it's so full because you see it's filled with gas. And those bacteria make a lot of gas. And I know that you have probably seen zebra running on Safari Live if you've been watching for a long time. Certainly we often see the zebra running close up in the Sabi sand. And sometimes, well, we've seen them running a lot here. And you know what they do when they run, Brooklyn. They often do what my dad calls let fly, which means they fart. And that's because of all the gas there in the cecum. So that's what that is. And you've actually got a seek in Brooklyn. It's just very, very small. And it's called your appendix. Your appendix is just at the end of your large intestine. Now this lioness has seen, smelt, or heard something. Probably that small pixel that Graham spotted on the thermal imaging camera. It doesn't seem to be coming any closer. What direction is she looking, Graham? Sort of towards seven o'clock. We can't see anything coming on the thermal camera. That little pixel. You could hear something being killed, Graham says. Where, Graham? Let's keep her on the floor there, Graham. We just can't move her on, she's very close. Can you still see her, Graham? You want me to drive, I'm going to drive forward slightly. Something is being killed, possibly a buffalo. Let's move. I'm going to turn the lights on. That is really vile. Where do you think, Graham? What direction? Well, she's heard it, everyone. Don't sit down. Come on, go and find whatever it was. 
Okay, let's be quiet here for a second, everyone. We're going to give a hard listen. I can't hear anything, but we've got lots of ears on the car. So everyone's trying to listen. Again, you can see the lioness has left that zebra. Why? It's fresh food, you'd think. Can't hear anything at the moment, but she's definitely heard something. She's also, is she facing the wildebeest? No, she isn't quite. She's facing, she's walking off. She's walking back towards the, where the other lionesses were. This is very interesting. Well, the only way to solve this mystery is going to be to follow her. So that, everyone, is what we shall do. Two o'clock. Twelve o'clock. Okay, I'm going to put a bit of light on, otherwise we're going to hit something. There we are. Still at twelve. I can't hear. Two thirty. No, oh, she's right here. She's right next to us. Let's turn off here briefly. There she goes. She's now hunting the wildebeest, we think, everyone. We think we have a hunt on. Mr. Wallington is convinced of it. This is excellent. Let's see what happens. I'm going to follow her just within the infrared range. And there we got onto the thermal camera. You can see where she's going. Those are the wildebeest in the distance. It's going to be a little bit bumpy. Seasick safaris, briefly. But there she is. She definitely seems to be moving around them, possibly losing, using the wind. Gosh, this is fantastic. Grief. Can you imagine safari life with two lion kills in one night? And have you seen that? We've lost the flare somehow. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit quicker. Right arm down. So, just to explain the numbers that have been called out, I cannot see, I cannot see what's going on, everyone. Um, I am driving blind, in the same way that a helicopter pilot, I suppose, flies blind with instruments. My instruments are Jean Dre on infrared and Graham on thermal image. One o'clock, slightly right hand down. Let's quickly go back to Jamie. I think she's got something interesting. We've just seen a large spotted genet, which is something I've been dying to get on camera. I know you saw one with Taylor not so long ago. I'm really hoping we can get this one back on camera in a moment. Unfortunately, it ran away just as you were being sent across to us. Hold on a moment. Let's see if we can't find it once again. Come on, Jenna. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, I don't think we're going to get it, I'm going to try, come on little Janet, they're one of my favorite animals, they look like a cross between a mongoose and a cat, that's the way I always think of them, like a small long cat. They are not, in fact, a cat. They belong to a totally separate family called the Viverids. They're from the Viveridae family. Little predators casting about looking for insects and small rodents and looking for them away from our vehicle. Darn. Okay. Now, since our genet has disappeared, let's go back across to James and his exciting evening in the Mara. 
Look, everybody, look at this. The lioness, those, those little dots in the, in the end there are the eyes of the wildebeest. She's walking straight towards them. I'm going to have to cut all light now completely for us. Chandra, we need to be an eye arm. I'm sorry, man. I'm going to move slightly forward. Try and zoom in a bit. Sorry, man. She's going to chase now. Okay, I'm going to move a bit closer. Still at 12. There she is. We've got her there. I've got her. I've got her. She's walking straight towards them. They have no idea she's there. I can see absolutely nothing in front of me. It's completely, completely black in front of me. Right hand down. This is unbelievable. Right hand down more. Okay, I'll try. What I don't want to do is spook the wildebeest. We're behind her by about, oh gosh. Sorry, we drove onto a hump. Oh, damn it. You still with her, Graham? Right on down. Okay, I'm gonna have to turn some light on. I can't see. Okay. Okay, okay, light down. Sorry, buddy, we, we, we. Okay, she's running, she's running, she's running. Okay, you must tell me, guys. Right hand down, right hand down. Okay, don't, don't shout. So exciting, everyone, this is so exciting. My heart is pounding. She's running. Where must I go? She's flanking on the right. She looks like she's flanking left. Hold on, everyone. Give me a number. Right. Give me a number. Okay, we're going straight, everyone. Are you okay, Graham? So I nearly lost Graham off the back there. That would have been a small disaster. Well, a very large disaster, actually. Can't tell what's happening at the moment. I don't know if she's. We're going to keep going straight. She is on the left of the wildebeest. Okay, we're going to keep going straight. <laughs> going to keep going straight. I know you can't see anything, everyone, but we really don't want to spook the wildebeest or her. Now, she's closing the gap now. She seems to flank them from the left. I'm just watching a little bit of the uh, thermal camera. She seems so close to them when we saw them. And I don't know if they were spooked or if they ran a bit. But maybe we just fell behind when we hit that termite mound. Can't tell if she's running or not. Now she's running. She's running at them. I think she's running at them, everyone. I can just see the movement. I can see eyes in front of us. The lioness moving straight towards them. I'm going to have to kill the lights again. So now I'm driving completely blind. Can you see her, jean -Ray? Okay, I got her now. She's running now. Oh my goodness, look at that. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. She's running. She's running. She's going. She's going. Right hand down, right hand down. She's running still. We can see her there, Graham. She's straight in front of us. There she is. She's missed.
How did she miss? She was right on them. Let's go to the wind. No, there's another line. There's another line, Esther. Everyone, my heart is absolutely pounding, mainly because I nearly lost the CEO of the back of the car. There, she's running again. There's another one running from the side there, Graham. Stay right, stay right. Yeah, there we go. Oh no, we've lost the battery. Oh, unfortunately, the Mara Lion seemed to need to take a lesson from the Incomets. As you can see, not much has changed here. All four lionesses are back. The other two are back from having a drink. And two of the adults are feeding. One's lying right next to us. There she is. And the other beyond. So I wonder where the youngest Inkholm is. Is she off entertaining a Birmingham boy? And will they be here tomorrow? Now, as I said, such little infighting due to the fact that they're so well fed. And that little bit of rain came too little, too late for a lot of the buffalo, or this buffalo in particular, and get a chance to pick up his condition yet. has been an absolutely incredible safari so far. Oh, is that mum going to get a little bit feisty? Cubs climbing on you, cubs putting their faces where you're feeding. Oh, and back to King of the Buffalo. Or maybe it's just a good spot to have a snooze if you're a little one. That's definitely one of the mothers there, you can see from her tummy. At least we know to where to find the Inkahumas tomorrow. Now I wonder if there's going to be Birmingham boys with them. Because if there was one within 10 kilometers, he definitely would have heard the distress calls of that buffalo. mad.
Hi, it's Zaki, who's 21 in Kenya. So Zaki's closer to James than to me. And uh, Zaki is wondering, how do mother lions know that their cubs are safe if they're too far away to hear the distress call? Well, Zaki, they don't. Uh, they have to rely on the fact that they've left the cubs in a relatively thick, safe area. <coughs> and the cubs have to rely on their instincts. So when the mothers are not there, they don't make a lot of noise, they don't move too much, they try to hide as much as possible. <laughs> the cubs pushing the adults away from the feeding area. Not too, too upset. If she really wanted to, she'd swap them out of the way. Or oh, give them a good lesson like that. That cub's about to get another disciplining. <laughs> and look at the back, those two. Well, who needs meat when you got mom's milk? So even though there's a whole buffalo right there, they're suckling. Those noises are just incredible. <laughs> and they know those lionesses are going to tolerate them, so they definitely do push their luck. As they get older, the lionesses will become less tolerant of the cubs feeding that close to them. And the cubs will have to learn to fight for their spot at the kill. Which they already do, even when they're suckling. Now, Monique in London says, I know we're giggling about the little growls now, but could they ever become sort of quite serious and aggressive? Now, Monique, there's always a chance that a lion cub will get swatted by one of the bigger ones and injured. I mean, one must remember, not too far back, there was a little Inkahuma cub. One of these guys who could barely walk for a while, and that's almost certainly from being swatted either by a Birmingham boy or an adult lioness when they were misbehaving around a carcass. But at the moment, while it's a time of plenty, it's not such a problem. <coughs> oh, yeah, big growl, spitting man. It's the only way, it's the best way to describe it. Now from a very successful hunt with the Inkahumas, let's go back to that lioness in the morrow who wasn't quite as successful. Oh, 
heavens, everybody, we have just had an experience, the likes of which you cannot believe. The, I'm afraid we just lost, we lost battery power suddenly um, as she chased and then she missed. She went off to the right hand side after one of them, didn't seem to even go to full sprint and then kind of, I guess she gave up as we lost battery. But it was tremendously, tremendously exciting. She got so close. I don't know how on earth she missed them. She could not have been more than five or six meters from them, maybe a bit more, maybe 20 meters from them. Uh, but she had a termite mound for cover. She was in complete and utter darkness. I must just reiterate that. I was driving utterly blind, couldn't see anything at all. And so the wildebeest had no idea she was coming and she missed them. And the other two are just to the right hand side of us. Um, they're not within the infrared range. She's looking or smelling something else. But the others are quite far spread out from here now. So I don't know what they're doing. It's all rather bizarre. She's looking quite keenly at something. Graham, nothing else behind us, eh? To the left. Lady Macbeth, you're wondering if um, one lioness can take out a wildebeest. Uh, yes, absolutely, easily, and especially as in a big herd of wildebeest, you've got wildebeest of all ages. You've got little calves. She's calling now. That's a contact call, though. That's, that's interesting. Ooh, what's going on now? The mysteries of the Mara lions continue. She's going past the left, is she, John Dring? Yeah. Well, she's dead 12. So she's straight in front of us now. She's coming back to the right. Very close. Very close to the car. That's next to you, Tyler. No, that's you, James. No, is that me? <laughs> <laughs> Where on earth this line is? That's me there. Hello, everybody. She's one meter away from us now, distance increasing. That's the thermal camera you can see. She's walking towards the other lions. Happy to move, Graham? Yeah. Yeah, they're all coming together now. I can put on a little bit of light because they're not in a complete hunt yet. Gee whiz, that was just incredible. So Lady Macbeth, yes, the lioness can absolutely take, oh, take out a wildebeest, um, probably an adult cow. Um, even, um, we, watched, we watched a lioness take out, well, an almost adult cow yesterday. Sorry, I need a number, guys. Say when? Ah, there they are in front of us. You just see them now. The edge of the infrared. And one on the right of us as well. Oh, they're all moving now. One at two o'clock. Okay, I'm going to go towards 11.30. Let's leave the one at two for now. She'll presumably join the others. Yeah, they're up and they're moving together now. All right, while we follow these lions into the night, let's head across to Jamie. She's got another Janet. There we go, finally. We managed to get our little Janet on camera. There it goes. Tuk, 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 tuk. Oh, wonderful. Uh-oh, where'd you go? Let's try and stay with it. As you can see, it is right next to Inga's house, which is where we live. How fantastic is that? The bright lights of James's vehicle reflecting beautifully in our spotlight. Let's see if we can't get it on the other side of this whoopsie termite mound. I might just go fall into bed. <laughs> just park the car and off we go. Um, where did you go? Okay, let's, let's try this. Hopefully it hasn't crossed already. We should be able to get a really, really nice view of it. Hopefully it's nice and relaxed. Seems to be.
him on little Janet. Go slowly. I've seen this Janet here before on my way home a couple of times and it's always been relaxed. Where did you go? This is where it was. I'm sorry, let me just check that side as well. How did it do that? It pulled a disappearing act on us. Did it go up a tree? They can climb trees. Huh. Oh well, at least we managed to get that one on camera, Dave. Mm. Absolutely. Let me just check the other side quickly. Hmm. Huh. It's vanished. Well, in that case, we're going to race to Galago Pan. We've just heard a report that there's a leopard calling there. I'm sure it's Tingana. That's the direction he was heading in. Okie dokie. Little Janet, sorry everybody. Don't know how it managed to disappear that quickly. It might have gone down a hole. Okay. Alright, I'm going to race to Galago Pan. In the meantime, let's head back over to the Mara. So the lions are now moving towards a woodland area where they seem to have heard something roaring or something calling. They had a full roar, which uh, as far as our hunting goes is not a particularly positive sign, but goodness, these mysteries that we are unravelling here, hopefully even further to be sorted. What is... Uh, just difficult to tell exactly what's on the thermal camera. They're walking right towards the woodland that is below the Ulalolo escarpment. Alulolo. Can't say that word. There were rumours of cubs in this area. Let's see. Now, quite unlike the woodlands of Juma, we will not be able to drive down into this woodland because it is well, it's basically a, uh, it's a sort of forest. It's a patch of forest. And we're keeping scanning, scanning, scanning with the thermal. She found something. She seems to have found something, yeah. Can you just move it on the side? moving again. Something coming out of the forest. No, nothing coming out of the forest. Right, there was one of them going basically into the forest in front of us. This one following. Not sure where the other two are. Graham, any idea? Other in two, other two in front of this lot. This might be the end of our lion tonight. Need to be very careful going in here. Hold on tight, everyone. Gosh, what a night it's been. Quite something if Jamie could top it off with another leopard. Are they calling again? They're calling. I'm just going to I'm going to keep going everyone. I would normally turn off, but I don't want to lose them. I'm just going to give you a quick listen. Something has spooked them, attracted them, caused them to come and think that there's some threat to their territory down here. Could be the males. I don't know. Hmm. 
And we've gone into some very thick stuff here. I'm going to turn the lights on, otherwise we're going to get ourselves into trouble. Yeah, they're having a bit of a play now. Where's that one, John Reece? Sorry. 12. 12 o'clock, keep going. <laughs> that, everybody, is a rather substantial canyon in front of us, over which we will not cross. What a night! <laughs> really does wonder what on earth they heard here. Marking territory, so something has alerted them. They heard something calling down here. They've come to mark their territory, that's why they were shouting, geeing each other up with their play behavior. Look at the heat coming off that bush that she marked. That's so cool. Let's have a quick look there, Jean-Dre. See, just behind her, that's the bush she just marked. Look at the heat on that. It's no wonder that zebra stayed warm for so long. There, what's that at the far end of the, of the screen? I wonder what that is. Could be a... Doesn't look like a hyena to me. Might be. Goodness, I wonder what that is. Top of the screen, everyone. Whatever it is, is running now, and they've stopped. <laughs> and still, in the bottom of your screen, that bush that she marked, you can still see it there, just moving on the top, top right. It seems to have disappeared now. I think, well, it looks like they're looking towards whatever that was. Are the lions at, uh, where are they, at 11 o'clock? Yeah. I'm just going to swing the car slightly, Graham. I won't go forward, fear not. Do you see them at all? There they go. They're going off to the left-hand side. Jean, hello. You're in North Carolina. You say, which pride is this that we're watching? Jean, this, we think, is what is termed the Out of Africa pride. Seems to be four lionesses. Might include two cubs. It's all rather confusing. Now, we started off this, um, well, this kind of five-day lion hunt with the Kitra Tembo pride. Four lionesses. We think maybe another one. Not sure. And two young males. And then the three males that we've been watching. Morani, a famous member of the Four Musketeers who was around this area with Scarface and two usurping blonde males. They've also been around here and then this lot here. A couple of nomads we've seen and we've even seen the great Scarface himself. But this lot, we think, are what is known as the Art of Africa Pride. That's rather fascinating. They've gone to sleep there on a ridge down through the dip. Yeah, and they're continuing to move down there. Something attracted them, everyone. They were on the hunt briefly, then they were sleeping, and suddenly they were up and calling and coming through here. Maybe they've got cubs here, maybe they heard another lioness calling, or maybe a male lion calling the other side of this woodland. It seems to be a natural boundary between them, and um, possibly the territory off to the south. We're facing pretty much due south now. But who knows? 
Well, it's a great honor to be learning all of this stuff from one, one of the most beautiful places I've ever experienced. I hope you've enjoyed it with us. I'm sure you have, especially as it has been trumped tonight, I suppose, by the Ngahumas and their cubs and their big buffalo meal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, Rain. You say there's you, you're 16 years old, and you say the lions in the Mara seem to be uh, different in their behaviour, in that they just seem to frolic around a lot. They don't seem to be do you know they kill their animals and then they don't eat them. Rain, I think it's very much a not a function of the fact that they behave differently here. I, you know, if you were to drop the Inkahumas here, I think they'd behave in very much the same way. Um, I think it's just the fact that we're in the migration season. There's a lot in the way of prey around here at the moment. It's almost like a sort of three-month festival that they have. And everything's excited. There are wildebeest and zebra and Thompson's gazelles leaping across the river every day. They're coming into the clearings at night. Some of them are just dying of natural causes. It's like a real bonanza, smorgasbord of things for these lions to eat. And I think that's why they're behaving very differently. Toss in the pride male takeover, those two blonde usurpers coming in, kicking out Scarface, making friends with his brother Morani. Well, I just think it's got all the makings of a great, great story here in the Mara Triangle. And that's what's going on. I don't think biologically these lions are behaviorally different from the ones down south that have just fascinated us all by killing that buffalo and then bringing their precious little cubbies to have a meal with them. I believe one of them was sleeping on his food. Terrible habit, that. Yeah, nothing, nothing on the thermal there in the trees. You know, if a leopard had called here, there has been a leopard calling here tonight. I don't think these lions would have reacted. I think it's another lion that's come up from the other side and possibly called once. And these guys thought, no, 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 that's not going to fly. Phew. <laughs> Chandra, you've got no sight of them, hey, outside of the, outside of the infrared, at least the thermal. All this technology is so deeply confusing. In the background, we can hear some hyenas calling. All right, well, I think we're going to have to turn around. Gra Graham, did you see all four go in here? No, we've only seen the three. Yeah, yeah we've only seen the three. Anyway, we'll go and see if we can't find the other one and maybe do a brief turn around, see what else there is, and we'll catch up with you once you've said goodnight to Brent Lear Smith, who I'm sure was beside himself with excitement at the Inkahuma kill today. What an evening. Uh, the incredible Incahumas doing what they do best, catching buffalo. Now, that was absolutely fantastic. What a welcome back for me. First drive back, Lion Kill Live. Now, I started uh, today's drive with a little music quote. I think I'll, I'll end with it as well a little bit later. So, uh, Oh, where'd it go, where'd it go? Look at him, look at him, look at him, look at him go, let him go! Almost no tail. See his little bushfault gerbil. See how short his tail is? I actually don't think that's a bushfault gerbil. They've got longer tails. I actually don't know what little mouse, mouse species that is. Or maybe he's just lost some of his tail. He's not keeping still for us to look. No, I think he's lost, that is a bushfault gerbil. I just think he's lost half his tail. Maybe had a lucky escape from an owl. That's not cool. I love those little things. Um, we don't get them here in the Sabi Sands, but uh, when I grew up in Botswana, probably the cutest little mouse you've ever seen in your life. And it's got the best name as well. Its name is a tiny fat mouse. And they're about this big and they're really little chubby guys. 
That was so cool. Now, I was actually hoping to find an owl in this area, but instead we saw what an owl has for dinner. Now, it is going to be fascinating to see tomorrow whether the fifth lioness arrives with a Birmingham boy in tow, or maybe just a Birmingham boy arrives. And, uh, of course, unfortunately, we can't stay out after 10.30 in the Sabi Sands. That is the, the curfew. Now, the curfew is there uh, to make sure there's not too many people driving out and doing naughty things after dark, of course. But uh, what an incredible, incredible uh, way to come back. And lions, I love those in Kahumas. Eggsy's first kill. Uh, so Eggsy's also smiling from ear to ear. So, and uh, I started the drive with that little quote from the late, great Lou Reed. Let's take a walk on the wild side. And we certainly did. And so good night. And we'll see you tomorrow for the sunset safari. Uh, let's go see Jamie so she can also bid you adieu. an incredible afternoon and evening it has been and I hope you've all enjoyed it at home. I've come racing down, believe it or not, to the back of the DRC, which is the camp that we live in. So we, I went to Gallego Pan, I heard the leopard sawing and he's between us and the Gallego Pan in the most impenetrable thicket imaginable. So I was just hoping that perhaps he might decide and come and pay us might decide to come and pay us a visit at some point this evening. Unfortunately, he hasn't popped out. So I can hear him sawing still in the distance, just between us and a Gallego shortcut. So on that note, it ends a fantastic sunset safari. So a big thank you to Dave for his fantastic camera work, as always, as well as to the entire safari leave, live... I'm tired. <laughs> Safari Live team for their incredible work and a lot of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes and most importantly an enormous thank you to all of you for joining us and sticking with us and enjoying our experimentation. Thank you and have a wonderful day wherever you happen to be. I'll see you tomorrow for the Sunset Safari. Bye bye everybody. Three, two, one. Right everybody, what a day it's been. We're just going to go down the road here, down Graham's favourite slippy slidey road, onto the main road and just check because we've found one more bogey to have a look at and given that this is our very last night here in the Mara for this particular uh, sojourn in East Africa, let's just go and have a quick look at what it is. Not too quick, because if we go too quick on this road, this Land Rover will lie on its side like one of those lions. What a wonderful, wonderful experience it's been here. I'll just tell you my impressions as we go down the road here. We'll be about five minutes, I think, and then we'll say goodnight to you. Wow, to be in a place like this with the endless landscapes, colors that you just can't believe and pop out that no photograph will ever do any justice to, vistas that likewise no photographs will do any justice to, Three o'clock bogey, sorry everybody, I'll try and be poetic a little bit later once we've stopped talking about bogeys. Do you want to go off the road here quick? Let's go have a look, see what the bogey is. Try not to get stuck again. It'll be a, it'll be a great injustice for me to get stuck at, again at this late juncture. There's quite a lot of water down here. Anyway, as we move towards whatever this thing is, just the diversity of life and the sheer abundance of it has been overwhelming. And I've got to tell you, once or twice I've been left fairly watery-eyed by the things we've seen here. There's been terror, tragedy, triumph, little Thompson's gazelles being smashed by crocodiles and other tiny little ones making it across the river. The endless cycle of the migration, the wildebeest and the zebra going to and fro across the river. Well, that looks like an eland to me. What is that? I think it's a bokeh. It looks like an antelope, everyone. And we'll just keep going. For now, get one last look at it. Any ideas, anyone? 
two o'clock. It is the reed buck. <laughs> We're going to leave the reed buck alone. And you're all asking me what my favourite moment was. Uh, well, you know, uh, you're also saying thank you for the experience. Um, I think my favourite moments, everyone, have, has been have been sharing it with with you, learning with you about this amazing place and seeing things that I'd only ever seen on TV before and didn't really believe that they existed in reality, to be honest. And that I think the crossings probably my highlights. But as I said to somebody yesterday, they asked me what were the most amazing things that I saw. And for me, I think it's been the sheer space. Endless, endless vistas, different every direction you look, a plethora of life in every direction and that whole general kind of thing has been the highlight. Of course, the Thompson's Gazelle crossing yesterday was probably my highlight. With the, again, the tragedy of it and the triumph of the little one that got out, made it out, found the rest of the herd and went off happily. Unfortunately, it's going to have to cross that river again at some stage during its life. Let's pack it in everyone. I think we are into what might be described as the law of diminishing returns. We'll just quickly look down onto the road there. Can you see anything in front of us, Graham? No bogies. A very small bogey. It's probably a sleeping, rattling cesticular. And we'll probably leave that one alone for the evening. <laughs> All right, everyone. That's going to be it from us. Thank you so, so much for joining us. I'm um, oh, sorry, I've just unplugged my phone. I can't hear anything going on in the final control. Rebecca, you're going to have to give me more than 30 seconds to get through uh, all I have to say. Because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't talk very much. Um, <laughs> right, I'm going to firstly say a big thank you to jean Dre for his astounding professionalism. You have no idea the work that this fellow does over here. He really does work very hard. A huge thank you to William the Ascari in the back and his, um, well, biblically named colleagues who helped us out during the last four nights. A massive, massive thank you to Angama Mara for putting up with us. We've got Tyler with us today. He's down in the cockpit here. He's been extremely patient. He's about the same size as a genre and, and Graham, so he's been stuffed into this tiny little cockpit which was built for somebody my size. And a big thanks to him and his incredible team. If you ever come to this part of the world, that is where you have to stay because you will be overwhelmed by it. Mostly a huge thank you to all of you, of course. A huge... <laughs> Shut up, Rebecca. Let me speak. This is an emotional time. I'm going to pull you out if you're not careful. Um, and... <laughs> Big thanks to the Final Control for their efforts, of course, and to the uh, other guides at the Juma. They will also have experiences like this one day. But mostly to all of you for coming along the ride, because without you, of course, coming to these absolutely spectacular places would be utterly impossible. So thank you for coming with us, and we hope to bring you back here sometime soon. Until then, Rebecca, you may now cue the credits. I think she has cued them. Cue them now. Okay, we now have 30 seconds for me to waffle slightly further. So I will say to you again a big thank you for coming with us, and I hope that you will come back with us at some other stage. Who knows when that will be, but it's been a great pleasure, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.